Do you sometimes get responses like this from your team? Are you having issues being heard? Do you spend more time having to explain rather than taking action? We're here to help. I'm Bronwyn, and we're presenting Effective Communication for Trainers, a workshop for managers, trainers, and anyone who could use a bit more guidance on how to better communicate with their team. It's not your typical train the trainer. It's a class that serves as a tool that can be implemented in any training program. We'll discuss theories on communication, how to effectively create and give feedback, and implement some solutions for common communication issues. So come hang with us. Make yourself heard and get your teams on the same page. We'll chat, have a little fun, and give you some new perspective on better communication. See you there. Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Carly Curran and I'm the competitions manager here at the SCA. I'll be your staff host for this lecture. So welcome to value mapping the delivered price of green coffee and exercise in price. We'd like to thank Pacific Barista Series for supporting this Expo weekend lectures. And a few housekeeping things before we get started. You'll notice just to the uh, next to the chat, there's a tab that says Q&A. You can tab over to that and type your questions in to there, and we'll have some time at the end for Q&A. And um, due to the topic of this lecture, I'm going to read you the antitrust policy for the SCA webinars. The Specialty Coffee Association is committed to full compliance with the letter and spirit of European Union, United States, state and other applicable antitrust and trade regulations. It is expected that all members, member companies, representatives, staff and participants involved in SCA activities shall at all times avoid words and actions which may restrict or appear to restrict competition in our industry, including agreeing to set minimum, maximum, or fixed prices, competitors or potential competitors agreeing to allocate or divide markets, customers, territories, suppliers, or specific bids, agreeing to not deal with other parties, um, with another party, boycotts. Um, when discussions extend into this area of antitrust sensitivity, staff members in attendance shall request that the discussions be immediately stopped, and if not, shall terminate the meeting. Any questions about this policy or the perceived violation can be directed to executive director at sca.coffee or via the contact method on S any contact method on sca.coffee webpage. Okay, so I'd like to introduce our presenters today. We're joined by John Ferguson, a coffee specialist from the Arbor Day Foundation, Ed Canty from the General Manager of Cooperative Coffees, and John Cassette from uh, Royal Coffee, the VP of Green Coffee Purchasing. So I'm going to turn it over to them, and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end, and thanks for being here. Thank you, Carly, for the introduction. Um, it's a pleasure being here today. Thanks for uh, having us. This is the, I guess, the uh, one of the first uh, digital lecture series that I've ever been a part of. So this is kind of exciting. And thanks, Ed, for for joining us. Uh, John Cassette may be joining us later. He has some technical difficulties, but uh, uh, we'll be able to um, explore those uh, slides uh, as they come along if if uh, is unable to join us. So um, today we're gonna, you know the. The uh, the topic is about kind of exploring costs between um, you know the uh, the the path that coffee takes from the time that it's planted to the time that it's drank from seed to cup. But um, since that's such a complicated web of interactions, we're you know the the idea today is to really concentrate on just like a, a piece of that uh, between uh, FOB and uh, these delivered contracts that that mostly are are handled with importation uh, you know companies. And uh, or I think we've got some feedback. There we go. Um, lots of feedback. Sorry. I hear you, John. There we go. 
Um, and the second point is uh, to discuss how, how to conduct purchasing decisions for meeting your contract uh, terms and uh, copy uh, specifications. Um, so, you know, where does this conversation begin? Uh, as, a, as a copy buyer, um, we look at, uh, we define that as a price discovery process uh, where the buyer and the seller move from a general price for a product uh, and, and agree to a more specific price for their transaction. Uh, this discovery process uh, reviews factors such as the volume, location, timing, quality attributes, along with several additional factors. This cannot be simplified um, <clears throat> to really uh, explore that entire scope. So today, again, we're just kind of concentrating on the value that uh, uh, is added by importers, but we are gonna touch on um, a couple other aspects uh, throughout that chain of events here. Um, so what, what do green coffee contracts, uh, typically specify? So when I, when I got in like, I'm buying a, uh, a container of coffee or, 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 or a larger volume of coffee, uh, for a future purchase. And I am often asked to list all of these, uh, attributes. You, you could call and say, I'd like to get uh, 275 bags of Peru, but there's a lot more that goes into identifying the best, uh, situation and the best, uh, strategy for you to. To purchase that coffee so it's often asked you know what's what's the uh you know first off your origin the crop year the amount of bags that you'd like to have uh the port of departure is, is not necessarily a specification that that you would you would define yourself unless un, unless uh there there's a need for that but um the u.s port of arrival is something that's that's rather important as a buyer to understand where your coffee is coming uh uh to the U.S. port, whether that be Annex in California or uh, New Jersey uh, or in Houston, uh, and where that coffee is going to uh, end up, because freight rates from Annex uh, to Kansas City versus uh, Houston to Kansas City uh, vary a little bit. So this this is about kind of being able to be more efficient with how you're buying coffee, uh, and and with the hopes of being able to put that value uh, somewhere else in the supply chain, whether that be uh, to the producer or uh, to your cafe. Um, also, we, we, we discuss payment terms. So there are a lot of uh, differences there. Some people will give you net 30, some people give you net 90. I've even heard uh, of a quite longer range uh, for that. Um, quality terms. Uh, we also have uh, quality minimum targets, like as far as your cup score. And then there's the quality physical description uh, for Peru. It's, uh, this is a, just a Hypothetical example, uh, grade one RFA, which means Rainforest Alliance is another quality attribute that you want to add to that uh, uh, contract spe specification. And then the delivery month, uh, you know, when would you like that coffee to be delivered to you? Um, so the exploration of costs. Um, this is a simplified linear diagram, uh, a very traditional way of looking at the seed to cup map. You have farm gate, um, which I've kind of designed this in a way where the farm gate's at the bottom, retail is at the top. And there's a map in the background that, that shows South and Central America and then the United States at top. This is kind of a, a very uh, traditional way of looking at things. And that's how uh, we mainly interpret this kind of chain of events, although it is much more complicated than, than this uh, diagram shows. But let's begin uh, at the farm gate and then we uh, will move up to the processing export uh, exporting. Uh, we have a free on board, which is FOB price. And then we have uh, X warehouse uh, spot and delivered uh, contracts and then the retail price. And on the right side, you'll see that the roaster is usually uh, dealing with uh, with those prices. The importation is, is in, the, in, the, in the center and the exportation usually handles the, the price uh, negotiations at the bottom there. Um, so farm gate, what does that mean? It generally, it means the price paid to the grower. And, and you know, that is, uh, is also very hard to define depending on what kind of grower you're working with. Is it an association, a cooperative? Is it a, um, a, a state farm or is it a collection of independent, uh, growers that are, um, a part of a, you know, a, a collection, um, entity. Um, so, but this farm gate price is usually determined at the point of sale uh, with, you know, where the producer participates in a capacity as the seller of their own product. So it's uh, a, a farm or someone who has uh, coffee plants on their property. They pick that coffee and they are selling it to 
some other entity, whether that be a truck driving by or uh, a washing station or a receiving station of any sort. Um, the next step after that is um, the, the most complicated slide I think we have here, which is uh, the processing the exporting fees. And that's the, the, this gray area between uh, uh, farm price and FOB price. And this is often overlooked, overlooked and simplified as a hidden cost of the final FOB contract price. And I, I believe that the SCA is working on a, a, a diagram to kind of explore this area a little bit with more uh, uh, detail. And again, that's not the scope of, of this lecture today, but I think, Ed, you're going to um, kind of jump in here and, and give a, a little bit of an example of how uh, Co-op Coffees uh, uh, deals with this. So I'll, I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, John. So, yeah, um, I'm going to give an example specific to Cooperative Coffees uh, just to explain who Cooperative Coffees is, uh, is we're an importer that's cooperatively owned by 23 roasters around the U.S. and Canada. Uh, we import only fair trade and organic coffee on behalf of our membership. Um, so you got to understand that context as we go through any of these numbers, because these are very specific to our supply chain. Um, one thing to understand about co-op coffees is transparency. It's, it's a core value of our, our organization and some mandate by our members to be as transparent as we can. But we have to have a transparency policy around that. So we do assessments of our supply chain every year and we collect a lot of their P&L data quite honestly, to understand uh, the finances of the organization and to work through what uh, average farm gate price would be. But we're never going to share that information for a specific group to a supply chain. Transparency is only about us sharing what's ours to share. And this information, honestly, is for producers to share. Um, now, 38% of our supply chain has provided us with that P&L data. And you got to ask why. Um, it's very hard to get this level of detail for a few reasons. One um, is we found we had to be very clear on, is just I was talking about what we do with this information. We're using it to highlight value, not drive down cost. But we work in a market where producers are commonly paid less than cost of production. So we got to be very clear on why we're asking that. And even through years of working with it, you got to build that trust with your uh, supply partners in order to get this type of data. So that's the first line I have here, which is why we are basing this on 30% of our supply chain and the most recent assessment they filled out with us with PL data. Um, so what, what do we find from that, given all those caveats, uh, is that the average operating expense for the producer cooperatives we work with that provided us data is 56 cents per pound. Um, but there's a huge range there. We had some that were at 11 cents. We had others that went up to 96 cents. Uh, and there are various reasons for this. Some of them are truly just doing more basic milling and exporting. Others are doing a lot more detail into the work, uh, as well as maybe collecting a cherry, doing the drying and the milling, as well as a ton of social programs. Uh, but a few metrics we look at uh, when we try to understand the value that those groups are doing are, are, are things like this. And I have some examples. One is uh, producer to technicals ratio. Um, how, so technicos are the agronomists that work for the producer organization. They go out into the field uh, and help producers grow the best coffee they can and with soil health. Uh, for our uh, supply chain or, or this, this um, sampling of it, uh, the, there's 144 producer members to one technicos on average. But that, again, is ranging from 11 producers to one technicos to over 1,000 with the different groups. So there's a wide range. Uh, and then I threw in another metric here was just let's just talk about the staff who's working in those producer uh, cooperative organizations. Uh, on average, we saw it as 61. But again, that ranges from 14. Uh, I'm sorry, 61 producers to one staff member. But that can range from 14 to 198. Um, so there's a lot of differences and a lot of reasons for these differences, but the big point I want to get through is that there's a huge diversity of costs and there's a huge diversity in services that uh, producer cooperatives as well as any uh, uh, exporter uh, would be providing in the supply chain. Uh, and do we, if we have John Cassette, I believe he's going to take us through the next slides. Uh, and uh, if if we don't, I have a quick question for you anyway, Ed. Um, so uh, talking about FOB price is the next step here. This is this is where, um, as a uh, green coffee buyer like myself, talking to an uh, importer like yourself, Ed, um, if you gave me an FOB price of $3, we have to consider that the cost that you were talking about, the, the, the $0.56 cents per pound is 
we kind of want to reverse engineer that price in a sense, right? We we can we have to look at a lot of factors that go in, into you know be at you know the C market price is something that will impact uh, pricing in most cases as as a, just a baseline, but there are so many things to add a to on top of that. Um, so if let's say hypothetically an FOB price is around three dollars or whatever, you have to subtract out those average costs, and will that be what the farm gate price is, or even then it's complicated. It's yeah, no, great question. So, so let's just say that 50 cents was, was the uh, producer cooperative fee. Um, and so $3, that would mean, or I'd, I'd express that as saying uh, the average farm gate price is $2 and 50 cents. Um, it's not, it's not an absolute. Um, one way to think of this is if you're a cafe owner um, and someone was to ask you to go through your budget and determine uh, how much it cost to get that individual consumer that cup of coffee that's that's impossible right but you can go through your budget and use the big numbers to come up with averages and that's what this is it's just an average looking uh, at so in this example three dollars say it was a 50 cent uh, uh, exporting fee and for processing you'd be at two dollars and fifty cents on average uh, farm gate price is a way to think and of I, it and I and I like how you're how you em emphasize on average because as um as uh, most people who are, you know, like working in a cafe or a roastery, every one of our situations are unique uh, and very customized in the way that we run our own businesses and coffee is a business from seed to cup. And every entity that handles coffee is, is a business and it is um, customized in their own way. So they may be more efficient. They may not be as efficient. They may struggle to get uh, access to capital. They may be a smaller volume cafe versus a large volume cafe where you have a lot of uh costs that impact you differently so if you are doing an fob at three dollars that doesn't that, that's very arbitrary compared to you know a smaller or a larger producer and how that impacts their livelihood in a sense does that does that make sense I that makes yeah. move on. <laughs> i love the analogy yeah okay, i'm very we'll happy on. to see john cassettes on the call so we and we'll move on it. from here and uh john cassette welcome to the call and thank um, you I'm going to pass it over to you to, to kind of uh, actually after we, we finish this out um, after the FOB price, we have the X warehouse. This is where the, the world kind of goes into the importation stage. And that's where we uh, have a little sure. bit more solid information uh, to go through. We have different contract terms like X dot X warehouse and spot. And again, uh, John Cassette will go over that in, in a little bit more detail here in a second. And then we have delivered, which is a, a different form of a contract where, um, the coffee is you know, sold for delivery to the warehouse, roasting facility, or buyer's choice destination, and all inland transportation costs are included in that contract price. And then, and then at the end of the at the end of the chain, we have here uh, the the final price the customer pays, and a customer can be loosely defined. It's uh, and and defined in many different ways as far as B two B or B two C. So it could be a wholesale roaster selling it to um, a cafe that is then selling it to the final customer, or it could be a uh, roaster retailer that is uh, buying the green coffee, roasting it, taking that shrinkage, and then directly selling it from their roasting facility to their, their customers. So there's a lot of different prices that go into that, and, it's, and, and it, and it uh, impacts uh, that cost uh, quite differently. Um, so we're going to concentrate today for the rest of the, for the, rest of the um, uh, presentation on kind of the, the center focus, the, the, the FOB, X Warehouse, uh, and, and the kind of the delivered price of coffee. Um, with what what's the value that uh, you know importers bring to this scenario, and um, I'll, I'll pass it along to uh, John Cassette with Royal Coffee, and kind of address the role of the importer and the costs involved in importation. Take it away, John. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining our virtual presentation. Thank you, John and Ed, for bringing us up to this point in the discussion. Uh, my name is John Cassette. I'm a trader for Royal Coffee Inc. here in Oakland, California. And um, I'm going to share with you folks all the details involved in getting the coffee from the country of origin to the final destination and uh, um, everything involved in that and uh, so forth. So, move on to the slides. Um, and the starting point for everything we do is the FOB, as John pointed out. And that means 
when the coffee is safely loaded onto the shipping vessel uh, in the port of origin. FOB, free on board or freight on board. This is, this is the basis that we purchase the coffee um, as an importer. And from here, all the costs and responsibilities are for our account as the importer. Um, so what does it cost to import a container of coffee? Uh, it's going to vary on a lot of factors here. And um, note that all the containers we bring in are generally 20-foot containers. And they're going to be loaded with anywhere from 38,000 pounds to 42,000 pounds of green coffee. Um, so uh, we've begun the transaction. We bought the coffee on an FOB basis, for example, $2 a pound from a cooperative or an exporter. And then it all begins. Uh, the first and most obvious cost we're going to have is the ocean freight. Uh, every container that we buy is going to you know, have a a freight cost as low as $1,200 up to maybe even $4,000. And obviously that's going to be based on the, demand, the distance traveled for the container from the port of origin to the uh, final destination. If it has to go through transshipments, time it's on the boat, and so forth. So those are the main factors. Every coffee we buy, obviously we have to pay for it. and. Uh, that's usually done via mechanisms of letters of credit or wire transfers or document collections. And um, these all have a cost. So in this case, we'll have the exporter sending us their documents to the bank or we have to open up a letter of credit. And the cost for each one, each container we bring in is going to be anywhere from $400 to $600 to initiate these payments which brings us to the docs themselves and paying them. Uh, typically, we receive the documents uh, while the coffee is still on the water. And we're not going to see it uh, at the final destination for a couple more weeks or maybe even a month or so. So the clock starts ticking as soon as we have to pay for it. We pay for the coffee immediately upon reception of documents. So the interest fees could be anywhere from $300 to $900, maybe more, depending on the total amount of time we have to finance the coffee. Now, we have to import the coffee into our country. And to do that, we have to pay US customs fees. Um, and we have to use a custom broker to do that. And the typical fee for that is about 300 bucks. Uh, it has to, we have to do that with every container we bring in. Uh, we have to insure every container that we import. And that fee is usually around $200. It's more of a catastrophic insurance coverage as I'll point out a little bit later. Um, and then uh, this is everything we need to do just to get the coffee to the country that we're importing to, the United States in this case. This gets it to the port. Now, from the port, we have to get it to our warehouse or to the door of the roaster or to wherever. Um, and so the coffee has to be drained from the port. Uh, to the roaster or warehouse. And that's going to cost anywhere from $400 to $1,800, obviously, depending on the distance travel. If it's located very close to the port, it could only be $400. Bucks. Uh, if, it's, if we have to transport it inland or to another state, it could go up to $1,800 or even more. Uh, once the coffee's at the warehouse, it has to be unloaded. So it's going to cost another $250 to $350 bucks to do that, about a, basically a dollar a bag. And then coffee needs to be weighed and sampled, another $150. Um, if we have to store the coffee, it's going to be roughly $200 a month for the container. Um, and then once the coffee needs to be shipped out to a, a roaster, it has to be palletized, loaded out. And these all have fees. The palletization could run generally anywhere from $10 to $20 per pallet, plus the loading out fees. So that starts to add up. And this is what is involved just to get the coffee ready to go back out to a roaster. As the coffee's coming in, anything could happen, uh, and often does. Uh, lots of unexpected costs. Um, I've listed them here, demurrage, customs exam, and all kinds of damages. Um, with demurrage, that's a case when coffee has arrived at the port and we don't have proper documentation to get it released 
by the steamship agency to pick it up. We're allowed like a week free time once it gets here. And if we don't have our act together and the paperwork ready for them, we can't get the coffee out of the port. And uh, every day it takes beyond the free time, we're charged $200 a day for that. Um, second case, customs exam. That's when the U.S. Customs decides to seize one of our containers. It's totally random. And uh, what they'll do is the coffee, the container is brought to a neutral warehouse. And there it could be stripped and examined, uh, go through an x-ray exam. They could send dogs in to check everything out, look around, give a sniff. And whether they find anything or not, we're going to get charged $1,200 for that. And then, of course, the other the scenario that frequently happens, there's going to be some damage in route. This could be a leaky seal on a door, a, a hole in the corner of the container. Um, and so we open up the container and voila, we've got you know wet bags that we have to recondition or destroy. Um, there could be excessive weight loss or moisture damage. And we have insurance for that, as I pointed out, but uh, it's important to note that it's a really high deductible. So the insurance is more of a catastrophic thing. Uh, so in this case, up to $5,000 deductible. So any losses up to $5,000, or uh, we're going to have to eat. And we try to just sort of amortize that cost over every container we bring in. But again, anytime it happens, it's pretty unfortunate. So as we showed here in that diagram, we know all these costs. For everything involved and uh, we know what we paid for the coffee the FOB price so once we have all that together we can calculate the total cost to get it from FOB origin to the destination and the different delivery terms so I'm going to show here the most simple one is X doc what this means is we purchased the coffee brought it in imported it, got to the point of the port of origin, and at that point we can release the coffee to a final buyer. Um, this is the most simple case of buying and selling coffee as an importer. We bought it, we paid it FOB, we paid the import cost, we released it right in the port to the buyer. And it's the cheapest way to do it too. Um, it's only probably eight cents to 15 cents. It only involves the freight, the insurance, customs fees, uh, bank fees and that's about it. Uh, the next scenario is almost the same. It just means delivered. It just means we're going to be taking the coffee from the port, the full container, and bringing it to the door of the roasting facility or a warehouse of their choice and just dropping it off there. It's theirs once it gets there. The only difference between X dock and delivered is we're paying the drayage to the final destination. So that's going to add a couple cents, maybe quite a bit more if we have to bring it all the way to uh, the middle of the country or something like that. And again, I want to reiterate, these are just the costs from FOB to fulfill it to these destinations. Um, the final case is X warehouse. Um, this is when we bring the coffee all the way into either our warehouse or to a public warehouse. And we pay all those fees of unloading. Uh, storage, sampling, weighing, palletization, outbound charges, reconditioning charges, and so forth. So clearly, that's going to be the most expensive option. Um, it includes all costs. And that's going to run anywhere from $0.13 cents a pound to $0.25 cents a pound, again, above the FOB price we pay. So for example, we buy a coffee for $2 a pound from Columbia. By the time we get it into our warehouse and do all the things we need to do, our cost is up to to anywhere from you know probably around 215 a pound. We're bringing it into the middle of the country, uh, Wisconsin, for example. It might be two twenty two dollars and twenty cents a pound. And so, in the course of all this um, activity, we bought the coffee, we've financed the coffee, we've cupped the coffee. Uh, we may have had to hedge the coffee. Um, there's numerous people in our company have, have touched the container by the time it finally gets in. And uh, so we can, you know, we know what the costs are. 
Um, then how do we determine the price at which we want to offer the coffee to the roaster? What services the importer provide in the transaction? What's the value added at the cost? What is a reasonable amount of profit we, we can assume? So before I get into that, let's first kind of look at some of the things we're doing beyond just the physical act of importing the coffee. Um, first off, we're working closely with the people we buy the coffee from, either the uh, cooperative or an exporter, maybe even a grower. So for them, we're providing a market for their coffee. We could be providing occasional pre-financing to them before it's even put together, a couple months before the export period. Uh, we can provide contracts for them that they could use as collateral for loans. Uh, we provide a means for the producer exporter to fix their price at an optimal time in the market, independent of the pricing of the final buyer. What that means is if we buy the coffee at a differential above the C market from them, they can fix it anytime they want. If the market's up to 130, they can fix their price. Has no bearing on how we may have sold it to a roaster. That's an independent act. And finally, and most valuably, I think for the exporter and producer, we pay for the coffee expediently upon reception of the shipping documents or the opening of the letter of credit. They don't have to worry, it's done. And then what role do we pay, play for the coffee roaster? Um, well, obviously we safely transport the green coffee from origin to their roasting facility or to a coffee warehouse. Uh, we vet the coffee quality prior to importation. Our quality control department gets the samples, we roast them in our office, the whole team gets together, we cup the coffee and make sure it meets the specs that it should have. Um, we provide the option of allowing the roaster to fix their price at an optimal time in the market, independent of the price paid to the producer exporter, the exact opposite of what we did for the exporter. Uh, the roaster can fix his price, say the market goes down to a dollar, he can fix his price. Um, and has no bearing on what we pay to the exporter. Uh, we provide financing and storage of the green coffee. We provide marketing information linking the roaster to the producer. We provide logistical support in the transport of the coffee to the roaster. So it's a lot of work. And this goes on with every container we import. And as I pointed out, the amount of hands that touch this, the amount of people involved is significant. Um, the, again, all the quality control people, the traffic people, our money people, the hedging people, myself, uh, our warehouse staff. So by the time one container is landed in our warehouse, we might have 15, 20 people involved in just one container. And this happens with every container. So what's that worth? What's the value added to that? Uh, well, for an example on how one importer arrives at this decision, I'm going to hand it back to Ed Canty here. And he's going to discuss how the cooperative coffee pricing model that they use to determine what a reasonable margin is for them. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, so import margin. So John went over the cost of imports, and these are pretty standard across most importers. Uh, freight for one company going through a broker is similar to another. Um, what I'm talking about is the margin, what we charge above that to do our business. Um, I need to explain a lot of context around this one as well. Um, for one, cooperative copies, it, the slide I showed before, I had to be very vague because that was not our information to share. But I have the privilege of working for an organization that values transparency, and it's a mandate for me to be able to share the details of our business. So I get to share this with you uh, in, in a way that maybe some other organizations can't, uh, and, and that's a good thing. Um, so to understand a few different things, one, we have to talk about the services that are related to um, uh, co-op coffees, and that is on the left-hand side. You guys can all still hear me, right? Thumbs up, good, sorry, my screen's looking a little weird. Um, so those services are producer, one is we do producer assessments and we have an impact program where we're actually um, doing projects with our supply chain on behalf of our membership. Uh, we also manage a transparency website on behalf of our members. 
uh, which uh, anytime we sell a bag of coffee to them, it shows up on fairtradeproof.org and they can, uh, their customers can look up information about uh, the supply chain that coffee came from. Uh, we have a carbon climate and coffee initiative, which is part of our impact program where we do carbon calculations with our members. Uh, we do work to put more carbon in the ground uh, in, in our supply chain, and we're working towards having a carbon insetting program. Uh, we store coffee. Uh, on average, uh, our annual turn rate is for this year is 2.3. So we're, we're on average storing coffee for a little over six months on behalf of our members. Uh, we're a community of roasters. Uh, we have committee, many committee calls, a bunch of different committees and a bunch of different ways to engage with other owners. Um, so that takes up some of our work. And then the, the members are owners of the organization. So we're a little bit of an odd duck uh, as an importer compared to some other ones. And that you got to understand that as you look through these figures. Um, what this really means is one, uh, we're, uh, we're smaller than most importers. We do about 120 containers a year or 5 million pounds, uh, but also we have that focus on member services uh, and that takes up some of our budget that might not on others. Um, these two graphs are out of our annual report for last year. Um, and we wanted to explain some of that context as we, we dove into what our margin was. Um, and the donut you can see on the bottom is, is our attempt to talk about what, what's the mix of our customers. The inner circle is just a count of the customers we have. And by customers, those are members and we sell about 7% uh, to non-members. So together they're just our customer base. Um, now over half, 55% of our customers only buy up to 300 bags annually from us. Um, so their, their purchases are fairly small. Um, and you can look at that above, they're only really accounting for 13% of the total um, uh, volume that we bought for that year. So it's the same amount of work selling five bags as it is five containers. Uh, and so there's the margin, the bracketing that we charge for smaller purchases, like any importer is larger than it would be for someone who's buying larger amounts of coffee from us. So now I wanna go down to break down our margin now that you kind of understand some of that. On average last year, uh, which was our fiscal year ending last June, um, our margin was 37.3 cents. And that ranged from 21 cents for bigger orders uh, up to 43 cents uh, for much smaller orders. And this is breaking out our P&L, our looking at this. At the very base of it is general administration. That's our offices uh, in, in Montreal and in Georgia, uh, down in America's Georgia. It's uh, for all of our staff. It's uh, managing options uh, and, and futures if we were in that kind of account uh, on behalf of our members. Uh, it's keeping the lights on and it's the work that we do. Um, bank and finance costs. So we uh, rely on a bank partner, uh, RSF, uh, who does a great job in looking at our assets, our inventory, um, and our AR and give, that leverages money we have to trade. Um, and we, we have to pay a financial cost on that. So that's included in there. Profit, when you do asset-based lending, the banks like to see you make a profit. So we uh, say that we wanna make a five cent per pound profit to show that we're a great co company. That actually ends up being equity to our members. So it does go back to our membership, uh, but we need to show that on our books. Uh, then there's green inventory management, the storage of that coffee. My lights just went off. Um, the storage of the coffee that's, uh, uh, as I said, we hold on to it for six months. So there's a cost to that. Um, and then where are the other expenses? Uh, other expenses, not a lot of them being used right now, but traveling, running events at Origin, going to trade shows, all of that work. Um, and then at the very top, it's marketing. To be fair, member services really is embedded through everything. Our marketing expenses are so low um, because we already have our customer base set. They're owners of co-op coffees, so we don't have to do a lot of marketing to get new customers. Um, there are Most of them are fairly set, so that's a smaller amount of money that we would spend. So again, this is just very specific to cooperative coffees, uh, but wanted to give some ideas on what a margin for an importer of our size can look like. Uh, the last slide I'm going to share with you and I think we're opening it up to questions, I believe, John, um, is value mapping. Uh, when, when John called me to do this, uh, he had me at value map. Uh, I, I'm a big proponent of value mapping a supply chain. When I was a, a buyer for a roaster, uh, I filled out a form very similar to this, a little more complicated for years um, and uh, required that before I did a purchase. What I tried to do here is to simplify this a little bit. Um, uh, Jonathan also has a, a great step that goes into a lot more detail 
Um, and I think that's going to be a handout. But this is also just a simple way of thinking about it is you want to separate out each participant in your supply chain, which is you can put in here is there's the roaster and the price that if, if you're a roaster, you're being told by your importer, it's going to cost X amount to get it to you with all the terms that we've talked about. Um, or then there's the importer and the role they're playing, your exporter and your miller and your producer. I'm going to actually say above that is a first step, combine that to FOB. Everybody wants to talk about Farmgate, but you can't talk about Farmgate until you've worked through the chains of your, the, the links of your supply chain closest to you going down to that producer. So you have to understand what the importer costs are. What are the services they're providing, both to producer and to you as a roaster? The exporter, what's the cost? What are the services they're providing up and down the supply chain? And then you can really understand Farmgate or what this means to a producer. So you have the names of who those participants are. You can break out the cost per pound. In this, the price to the roaster is the total, and then the sum of the other columns would equal that. Uh, your terms of your contract, and I list uh, uh, Jonathan went through this in the very beginning of the presentation. Uh, and I'm listing here that uh, a link to the GCA contract in terms, all of that stuff's written down. Most contracts reference the GCA. Um, and so those are the, the hard and fast contracts of the contract. Is it X warehouse? Is it delivered? Is it N, uh, NANS? Is it SAS or your quality terms? It's all written in there. But then there's also the list of services. And the list of services, this could, I, I, the more complicated, you could actually break each of those services down into cost per pound. Simplified way is to just, just list them. Um, very basic, I'm importing. So service I provide is import. But also, and I forgot to mention this on the other slide, um, we're also a cupping lab, not only as an importer, but we are the cupping lab on behalf of some of our members. So that's part of a service we provide back to the roaster. Uh, and you want to list out what all those services are through the supply chain. The big question in services that you got to ask is what's important to you? What's important that your, your producers have as services to them? Maybe it's more technical assistance so we can develop quality over time, or that there are social programs, uh, any number of things. Um, but a simple value map form like this can help you dive into those details and answer that question, or ask that question, what's important to you, and have your supply chain answer that. Um, again, from what I'm trying to show you through this is we were talking about uh, as being the exporter and the importer is you're going to see a huge diversity in price and you're going to see a huge uh, or cost and a huge diversity in services. Uh, and don't, don't be afraid of those. A lot of this is value creation. You want to understand, oh, this is more expensive, but I have a list of all these services. And if they're important to me, that's great. If they're not important to you, that's where you get into negotiating. Um, I'm going to leave that here. And uh, I think we're going to move back to Jonathan and talk questions. Yeah, real real quick to wrap up. I mean, the, the part of the inspiration for this um, for this presentation was stemmed uh, after listening to a podcast. I'm going to give a little shout out to a, a little podcast about uh, copy price transparency, a mini series by uh, 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 Evermeister and, and Chad Treadwick, um, where they where they kind of talked about how we're as an industry we seem to be hyper focused on on what people are doing at origin and what the price um, and the expenses are of, of the farmer and whatnot. And, and it kind of brought me to this idea of like, you know, and they had mentioned something about continuous improvement or like, how do you run your own business better? And that was kind of the inspiration for this is like, how can I do my job better to where maybe if I could save, I know it sounds kind of silly to a lot of people, but if I can save five cents a pound on a whole container, that could possibly be money that I could put into um, an, an FOB price and, and try to drive a little bit more value, you know, in, into that uh, part of the, of the value chain. Uh, now, not everybody's going to make that decision. Some people might save five cents and put it into uh, keeping their cafe doors open during rough times. So it, it's really just about how do you become more efficient? How do you get to be, you know, uh, a better buyer learning when you should receive your coffee, what value adds you you need for that coffee and, and how can you uh, create a more sustainable or, or at least a, a more long-term uh, uh, business, uh, not only yourself, but with your importers and with your producers. So after that, if, if there's anything else, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, pass it over to questions and answers. And thank you everybody.
Uh, we really appreciate the transparency. And as one of the um, attendees said, this is a really enlightening conversation. So thank you all for being here. There are a couple of questions. If you have any other questions out there, please put them into the Q&A tab and we will get them answered. So one question I have here is, do you rate suppliers based on the metrics of operating costs, number of technicians and staff ratio? I believe that question was for Ed. Yeah, um, so I, I wouldn't say judge them on it, but it explains the value they're bringing to the supply chain. So if there are more expenses there, um, you want to understand why. And stats like that, as well as many things, can help out uh, understand that. Um, you know, John was saying this where uh, you might have that extra five cents that you can put back to the FOB price. Absolutely. But you also need to make sure that five cents wasn't needed in that part of the supply chain to provide a service that's important to you. So you have to have that conversation. Um, we would never suggest any producer group, yeah, get, get rid of the agronomists. We don't need them. Agronomists are the lifeblood of the coffee that we're buying. So that's very important. We, we like to see more agronomists in our supply chain and quite honestly, are willing to pay for it uh, and to, to produce more fair trade and organic coffee. Um, but so I, I wouldn't say we're doing a bidding process and just understanding that number and saying, oh, we're going to go for this offer more than that. For us, it's really about long term relationships and working through some of those details just to explain why. Great Thank question. you. Yeah. Um, so the next question I have here is how do you feel about creating local artificial environments conductive uh, for coffee growing, hence uh, possible cost reduction? Hopefully it's not a leading question. Who's that for? Would you repeat that question? I, sure, to... yeah, let, no, it's okay. Let me, there's more coming in. So let me get back to that one. How do you feel about creating local artificial environments conductive for coffee growing, hence possible cost reduction? We, does, I, that, does that imply actually growing coffee locally? Yeah. Or, um, we, we don't have the altitude or the, yeah. the right soil um, to really produce quality coffee locally. Well, I mean, California, <laughs> maybe. I mean, it's good coffee out there. True. Shout out. To... <laughs> yes. Shout out to you, California growers, man. <laughs> Next question. All right. So let's go we'll go through here. Um, this one's from Austin. How can we communicate FOB and price of green coffee to consumers in a cafe or consumers of a roastery? Well, Ed, I, I, I would maybe say, is it, is it necessary? Uh, can, we, can we find a different conversation or, or one that might be more <sighs> valuable? Ed, I, Either one of you, I'm, I'm not, is the, is the conversation about FOB the one that we should be having with our customers? I'll tell you that the, the, the quote that always reminds me is the sign of an expert is someone who can take something really complicated and explain it simply. Um, we, we rely on our membership to explain that to the context of all of this to consumers. Um, for us, we just try to get them as, as much information as we can in a simple format to help them do that. But, um, that's a big question. Um, or even if you were to talk about a farm gate price, let's say to a consumer, what does that mean? I mean, there's opportunity costs of growing other product. There's the price of goods in that region. I mean, there's so many other things you need to understand to know what that farm gate price means. Um, and it's a daunting task. And I'm happy to say I, I rely on roasters to, to answer that question. John Cassette, I don't know if you have any ideas around this. I think a more challenging, uh, task for the person who's selling that roasted coffee to, to answer that question to the to their customer is if how come it costs fifteen dollars a pound <laughs> you know when if it's if uh, the FOB price is two dollars a pound I mean how do you make that translation and there's nothing wrong with that it's just there's a lot more unknown in that to me than there is in the FOB price so um every step in the chain has cost and value added uh and sometimes just saying what the fob price is isn't gonna provide a lot of light to the final customer yeah i, I 
probably add to that. Um, that if you're talking about an FOB price from Brazil or El Salvador, and then you're uh, then you compare that with an FOB price sale, um, Burundi, or a, a drastically different uh, uh, economy, and then looking at the $15 a pound in California and in the Bay Area, and $15 a pound in Lincoln, Nebraska, again the uh, the, the the square footage for for commercial space in Lincoln is 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 drastically lower. Um, the cost of living is much, much lower. So $15 a pound here is actually more expensive than it would be perhaps maybe in California. So, I mean, it's, it's never apples to apples, I think in any situation, except for if you have uh, two different coffees from, uh, you know, being milled in high end and being sold in, uh, in, in uh, Berkeley, uh, then there could be some apples to apples there. But even then you have, you know, uh, four different operations, uh, at possibly at different sizes, with different economy of scales, that would uh, that would make that FOB conversation um, possibly unfair to have. I don't, I don't know, um, or uh, to one of those parties. You know, you guys made me think of one other point. I just jump in where um, value creation. We've talked about it here as a way to explain the prices that you pay. But I, I, I am unabashed about also using that information to sell more coffee or have. Um, a roaster sell more coffee. For example, um, if we understand there's more agronomy and they're doing more work of creating living soils and putting more carbon into the ground, yeah, we want roasters to be able to tell that story of, yeah, this might be more expensive, but it's helping against climate change. That's a great story. So some of the details of value creation without going into all the, the pricing around FOB versus all these prices can be very useful to roasters. Thank you. Um, all right, we're, I think we've got time for two more. So I've got one from Clay here. Um, what is the relationship between farm gate? Sorry, it just jumped down. I apologize. Sorry. What is the relationship between farm gate and the sea recognizing fair trade as a floor and what is the general answer? Um, I would say there is a relationship, at least in the context of cooperatives, uh, because pr producers will go for whatever the highest price they can get. And if there are collectors uh, on the mountain offering a C price that's higher than um, uh, what would be a, a cooperative's sustainable cost of production, then, yeah, they're going to go for the higher price. So it normally tracks with it. Um, but in lower markets, I think that's where you have some differences. And I don't know if any of you guys have any other comments on it. Good question. Uh, yeah, it um, a lot. Of, a lot of it is related to the country itself and what kind of internal competition there is going on there. So uh, even if the sea market might be low, if there's a tightness in supply from that one specific origin, uh, prices on the street might be pretty high. Uh, might not even make sense as to what the sale price of a lot of coffee is, uh, the FOB price. And um, as Ed says, uh, a grower might be a member of a fair trade cooperative and be guaranteed this fair trade price all around. However, if there's so much competition going on, there's, there's a, every chance in the world that an independent collector could be paying more than the cooperative is on that given day. And a lot of cooperatives understand this and they kind of built in, they're probably not going to get 100% of their growers' coffee. There's going to be a chunk of it that's going to get sold elsewhere for immediate cash. Uh, and that's understandable. Thank you. All right, this one's from Olga. Um, this one's for Ed. Um, if you're expecting, um, if you're not expanding the cost of travel or events or attending, are you redistributing those funds? Um, how can they be used or redistributed? Oh, I didn't think we I thought we were going to get away without talking about uh, COVID on this call. Um, great question, Olga. So um, in the short term, we have used it uh, as to manage our business and to stay healthy through the uh, lower sales during this COVID time. Um, and but that's short term. But another thing we've done in Co-op Copies is uh, our membership has made the uh, decision to repurpose our impact fund, uh, about one hundred and thirty thousand dollars of it for immediate COVID relief. Uh, to producers in our supply chain. Um, I'll tell you the number one thing we hear from producers that they want right now is signed contracts. 
Uh, and that's something I think we all have to work through. But secondarily, there's a, a lot of food security issues going on in these supply chains as they try to keep COVID far away from their communities. So um, as of next week, we will, have, uh, I think it's around $45,000 we're gonna send out to our supply partners on behalf of this. Um, and that's a really shout out to our members, those small roasters uh, who are thinking of this at the same time as their businesses are experiencing some difficulties. Thank you. Yeah, can't get away from it at all, I think. Um, all right, I am gonna sneak one more question in because I think we have time. This question's from Dave. What initiatives are you aware of that are working to build, extract more value out of the supply chain of the, uh, for those in the chain? These may be stakeholders, service providers, not directly in the coffee industry, but could contribute to the value. I, I will be the first one to admit that I have not really researched that. I, I don't have any uh, quick answers to that, um, but I'll look into it and uh, possibly uh, add some to uh, the notes if you want to reach out to me later on. And I, I did want to mention uh, real quick uh, before we leave uh, that we do have a handout that uh, if you'd like to uh, access that would, um, you know, it's, it's, it's free to download and kind of use. And uh, there's also my contact information. If you have any questions uh, for me, uh, please email or, or or simply call me, uh, and I can get you in touch with uh, either Ed or John if necessary. If you need any help uh, in in those areas too. So, uh, Ed, did you want to mention anything else before we go? Um, I, I'll admit I didn't fully understand that last question. Maybe if it comes through email, we I can take a look at it if we're out of time. That's totally fair. Um, thank you. Um, I really appreciate this. Uh, lecture. I think it was great. I think the transparency is great and it's an ongoing conversation. Um, as John and Ed said, there is a handout. If you go over by the Q&A tab, there's a handout. You can download it there. Um, we're going to pop a survey into the chat window. If you click the survey link, it will take you to another tab. We'd really appreciate if you take that survey. And that concludes this lecture. Thanks for being here. Big thank you to John, Ed, and John for presenting. And thank you to Pacific Barista Series for supporting this whole Expo weekend of lectures. So please fill out the survey and thanks for being here. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you.